Hi, everyone. Hello, and welcome to class webinar on the priority of service provision for targeted high-need adults in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. This webinar is one of a series of webinars that are part of class WIOA game plan for low-income people. CLASP is a nonprofit policy organization that promotes policy solutions that work for low-income people. My name is Anna Solinsky, Senior Policy Analyst at CLASP, and joining me today will be Amy Martinez of the South Central Workforce Council in Yakima, Washington, and Debbie Cracky of Workforce Solutions for Tarrant County in Fort Worth, Texas. So first, I want to describe the priority of service provision under WIOA. For Title I adult funds for career and training services, a priority must be given to three groups. First, recipients of public assistance. Second, other low-income individuals. And third, individuals who are basic skills deficient. CLASP thinks this priority of service provision provides an opportunity to serve more high-need adults, which we strongly encourage. The priority is considerably stronger in WIOA than uh, under WIA. Under WIA, the priority was only for recipients of public assistance and other low-income individuals, not including individuals who are basic skills deficient. Most importantly, the priority only went into effect if the local board determined that funds were limited and said so in the local plan. Many did not determine that funds were limited, and so the priority did not apply. So let's take a look at the statute side by side. Under WIOA, you'll see that the priority is in effect with respect to funds allocated uh, to a local area for adult employment and training activities, whereas WIA says that the priority is in effect in the event that funds are limited. The change means that the priority will be automatic, not subject to a determination about funds. So we've talked about the statute. Now let's look at the new draft regulations. The draft WIOA regulations were posted on April 2nd and came out today in the Federal Register and are available on regulations.gov. CLASP is doing an in-depth analysis and will be sharing with you our comments before they are due to the department. Uh, today is just a preliminary look at what's in the regulations about the priority of service provision. Generally, there were some positive steps towards serving more high-need high adults, but there were also some potentially problematic language. So there were two draft regulations that CLASP thinks will strengthen the priority of service for high-need adults. First, as under WIA, the WIOA draft regulations require state and local areas to establish criteria for providing this priority. These may include the availability of other funds for providing employment training related services in the local area, the need of the specific groups within the local area, and appropriate other factors. Second, local plans are required to include the process by which priority of service must be applied by the one-stop operator. This elevates the level of importance from local policy to the local plan level making it easier for stakeholders to monitor. This is a provision that CLASP has advocated for, and we hope that people will support it in their comments to the department. Unfortunately, there is a proposed regulation that could potentially weaken the priority. So, uh, it says the local board and the governor may establish a process that also gives priority to other eligible individuals provided that is consistent with priority of service for veterans. So the issue here is that by being silent on whether these additional priorities have to be consistent with priority for high-need adults, there's some concern that priorities for other populations could be set above those for public benefit recipients, other low-income individuals, and individuals who are basic skills deficient. So uh, CLASP will be putting out a new paper uh, on Monday on this topic, and you all will get an advanced copy when you get the recording of this webinar tomorrow. In the paper, you'll see we'll, we're making a number of policy recommendations, which you can see previewed here. I won't read through them all, um, 
But instead, we want to ask your opinion on one of the recommendations in particular. CLASP is planning to recommend that DOL should base the implementation of priority of service for targeted high-need adults on the pattern of existing, robust, and detailed rules and guidance regarding priority of service for veterans. The good news is that the department already knows how to do this. DOL's final rule and guidance for the Jobs for Veterans Act of 2002 provided immediate clarification and extensive implementation support for implementing the veterans' priority of service, including all the provisions you see here on the screen. So here's our question for you. Um, what do you think of class recommendation to implement priority for high-need adults in the same way is the priority for veterans. Please use your chat box and let us know. We really appreciate hearing from you all. And while you send us some of your thoughts, we'll transition to our other presenters. First is Amy Martinez of South Central Workforce Council, Yakima, Washington. And she'll be followed by Debbie Cracky, Workforce Solution for Tarrant County, Fort Worth, Texas. So Amy, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Anna. The South Central Workforce Council covers approximately 10,119 square miles located in the South Central region of Washington State. And we are comprised of um, four counties, Kittitas, Klickitat, Skamania, and Yakima. Agricultural primary primarily fuels the region's economy, and the development of the overseas market for agri agriculture products is a major economic contributor. While labor is needed for the maintenance and harvesting of crops, which remain seasonal in nature, um, I have to say other than this year, technological advances have increased demand and opportunities for skilled workers in farm management and food processing. We didn't have much of a winter like most of you or some of you across the nation did. A substantial Native American population that lives within the borders of Klickton and Yakima County and our Hispanic population continues to grow significantly in each county, and a small but significant number of Asian Americans and black Americans reside in the communities across the service area. Um, uh, literacy among the adult population remains a concern um, in our area. According to a report done by Washington State Public Policy in 2013, the South Central Workforce Council area has some of the highest percentage of low English literacy in the state. The report in, um, in Yakima County had 52% of adults read below the sixth grade level, with 23% reading below the second grade level. In Kittitas County, 36% reads below the sixth grade level and 14 below the second grade level. Klickitat County shows 49 have reading skills below the sixth grade level and 21 below the second grade level. And finally, in Skamania County, 44% read at a level um, below the sixth grade and 15% in the second grade level. As well as um, we have high levels of poverty which continue to plague the South Central region. The Census Bureau shows um, the poverty rate for the U.S. remained stable at 15% for 2010 and 2011. In most all of the South Central counties, the poverty rate for families with children under 18 exceeds the state and U.S. rate. Um, those who live below the poverty level do not receive um, any form of assistance and are usually marginally employed. Others may work full-time but do not earn enough to allow them to support their families or achieve self-sufficiency. The, um, because of these, um, the low literacy levels and the high areas of poverty, the South Central Workforce Council um, WI, Adult, WI Adult Program decided to serve economically disadvantaged individuals um, who are the most in need for um, employment training services to help them attain self-sufficiency. Due to the poverty conditions of our sub-state region, the South Central Board made a decision during the JTBA era to serve those populations that are most in need. The board set, during that time, the board set a requirement that 50% of those enrolled into the adult program must be public assist assistant recipients. This practice continued during the early years of the Workforce Investment Act. 
However, due to high performance measures and declining resources, the board made the decision to include low-income individuals into the town of priority. The Workforce Council um, adult program serves less than 5% of the total eligible population that reside in Kittitas, Klickton, and and Yakima counties, and that's due to limited funding. Therefore, um, they decided to enact the veteran's preference um, due to limited funding, um, which they must come first. The decision was made to the board to do this based upon on our last strategic planning process and the reduced amount of funds um, for the eligible population in the state and area that we receive. So with um, limited funding determination, as of January 2014, here's the, the demographics of our WIA adult, excuse me, WIA adult program. 5% are veterans or their eligible spouses on public assistance or low income. 95% are on public assistance or other low-income individuals. With that, in both of these categories, 12% um, have a disability, 10% are on TANF or public assistance, 15% um, have basic, are basic skills deficient, and 25% are ex-offenders. And I want to note that some of these characteristics may be uh, one individual may have one or more of those as well. So we're going to get into the local priority of service for the South Central Workforce Council. First priority shall be given to program eligible covered persons, which are veterans and eligible spouses, who are low income individuals or recipients of public assistance. The second priority shall be given to recipients of public assistance and other low income individuals that are defined as an individual who receives or is a member of a family that receives cash payments under a federal, state, or local income-based public assistance program, received an income, or is a family member, a member of a family that received a total family income for the six-month period prior to program enrollment that does not exceed the um, federal income guidelines, is a member of a household that receives or has been determined within the last six months to be eligible for food benefits or SNAP, qualifies as a homeless individual or is an individual with a disability whose um, income meets the requirements described in section of one and two above. Third priority, um, the state of Washington when um, limited funding determination is in effect um, has us say the third priority shall be given to program eligible covered persons, veterans and their spouses, who are not low income and are not recipients of public assistance. And finally, our fourth priority, um, which is a local, the workforce board in our area uh, with other um, workforce councils across Washington State, shall be given to those who do not meet one of the following conditions. Their family is not yet self-sufficient, um, and they have a, the calculator.org, which um, is county determined who a family of a given size is eligible based upon their um, income, et cetera. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that website. Um, as well as unemployed or underemployed and are pursuing training in local de high demand occupational clusters as approved by the Workforce Board. And that is it. Um, here I know that we're going to have a question and answer at the end. If you um, don't get a ch your question answered, please, here's my email. Go ahead and email me if you have any questions. And thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Amy. Now we'll move to um, Debbie from Fort Worth, Texas. Debbie? Hey. I'm really tickled to be here today talking about this specific topic. Um, I think that I've learned a lot over the past um, 18 years about priority of service and what it really does mean. Um, I'd like to look at a couple of things first. Uh, and that comes about understanding who we are and understanding our role. The new regulations um, are pretty clear. I, I've had the opportunity to look through them for the last few days, and there were some things that popped up to me. Next slide. Um, the first will go with understanding our own role within those regulations. The new regulations are very clear. The services provided with any WIOA funds can be a pathway to the middle class for low-income adults, 
including public assistant recipients and individuals who are basically skill deficient. And interestingly enough, these three um, categories come up uh, at least 50 or 60 times within the regs, so I think they're very clear on who they're looking for us to serve. Uh, these new regulations are also really clear about who should be providing the services, requiring that programs and providers co-locate, coordinate, and integrate activities and information so the system as a whole can be conceived as being cohesive and accessible. Now, given just those statements, it may be a little hard to understand how this plays out in the real world, but I'd like to talk a minute about who these individuals really are. Uh, a good while back, um, I heard my boss tell me over and over again that you really have to look at who you need to serve and what the unemployment rate is. In our city and county, the unemployment rate stands at 4%. In Fort Worth, the largest city, the unemployment rate is at 4.1%, and in Arlington, the unemployment rate stands below 4% at 3.9%. So I would be willing to wager that a majority of the individuals who walk into our workforce center um, can be eligible under the priority of services very easily. I want to talk a little bit about the individuals who make this happen because the other thing we found is that if you get the right individual who really wants a job and is willing to go the extra mile, then what you're going to find out is performance then meets the work. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the projects we've done and how those projects have shown us what is possible. And let's look for a minute at the next step model itself. This project, along with several other projects we currently run, were based off a pilot that we did seven years ago, and we used TANF ECF money for that. Uh, and that model that we developed has now um, been proven through uh, uh, research and um, done by MDRC. This was a, the largest of the grants was a $6 million grant that looked at transitional employment and the services that go along with it. Most so these individuals were newly paroled and they had multiple barriers, not the kind of individual you would normally associate um, with a workforce center. There were over 500 individuals who participated in the experimental group uh, and most of, those, most of that time we worked directly with parole and probation and used their leadership to guide us. We also relied heavily on evidence-based assessment and case management models. And I want to talk a little bit then about the employment assessments. I'm not going to go over all of them. We have a limited time here, but I have included them um, in this particular slide in case you want to go back and look. What you're going to see, most of these you may know, but they're looking at cognitive abilities, they're looking at reading and math skills, they're looking at career assessments and what that individual wanted to do. Um, we added in there that uh, Texas Christian University's Criminal Thinking Scale and Gallup Strengths Finder 2.0. And if I could just put a plug in now, just a second, um, for Strengths Finder, I'd like to do that. We found that Strengths has been just an absolutely essential part of all of the projects that we've done, not just with ex-offenders, um, but also with non-custodial parents and a wide range of other individuals, including the homeless. And the reason we use this model is because it does give the customer language. It teaches them how to talk about themselves in a positive way. Um, it's very inexpensive to do. Um, and we found it just has incredible impact on the customers we serve. Now we'll take that strength and look at the next piece of this, which is customized job placement. We believe when you're dealing with customers who are the hardest to serve and have the most barriers, that finding the right job for that customer becomes paramount. If they're going to be in a starting uh, pathways job, something that's their first, um, their first step into that career pathway, then we know they've got to want to do the job and the job has to be well fitted to them. Using this technique, we've used work experience and transitional employment to let that employer know that we're in this with them um, and we're not asking them to take a risk that we wouldn't take ourselves. Um, this also teaches our own customers about real-time labor market information and helps them become their own um, job search tool. Let's look at the numbers that, that made this project 
a success because this is the thing that I have to admit we were a little surprised at. We knew it would work, but we had no idea the level of impact it would create. And remember, these are all customers who were either basic skills deficient or low income and some receiving uh, public assistance. What Department of Labor wanted to, do, to know is what happens at the first year mark of a person being in one of these programs. Does it help keep them out of prison? Does it help keep them from going back? And so by the final year of our project, all 503 customers had met their one year anniversary. Now the goal for the grant was 22% recidivism rate. At a national level, the recidivism rate stands at 44%. So basically, um, Department of Labor was asking us to cut that in half. Um, by the end of each customer's one year anniversary, we were both surprised and delighted to see that only 24 out of the 503 individuals actually went back to prison for a new crime. So our recidivism rate, we feel like, will stand at 5%. And that is pretty phenomenal when you consider um, what the national average is. So let's look a little bit about uh, who those behind the numbers and what those numbers really mean, because this is where it does play into, I think, any workforce board as you convert to WIOA. The average age of these participants were in their mid-30s. Most of these individuals had aggravated crimes they were committed of. Um, most sentences um, exceeded five years and in many cases exceeded 10 years. Um, we had one individual um, whose sentence was 42 years. 80% of these individuals were male. And then when you look at the assessments, what we've learned is that a lot of the things we think are barriers don't turn out to be. We did at the criminal thinking scale on each individual within the first week or two of their enrollment in the program. And just using that scale, it showed 53% of our customers were likely to go back. But, and the average um, cognitive thinking levels were well below the national average and their reading and math scores were very low. So if you just went with this, you would think that there was no way we could have succeeded to the level that we did. But we did. So what does all this mean to you? And how will this help you? Well, I do want to talk a little bit about the other part um, of the legislation and the rules that I found interesting. One of the things they discuss at length is that no single grantee is going to be able to provide all of the services that a participant will need. And WIOA is just one area, and we are going to have to partner with other community-based and, and uh, faith-based organizations as well as local, state, and federal programs in order to do this. Um, we can't be the end of services for people, but we can be the convener of services for individuals. And I'd like for you to look on the next slide because I've given you just some examples of a niche services with common goals. If you look in your community and you're looking at those um, priority of services that have to be done, and you're trying to figure out how can I go about doing this, look in your own communities for places like um, providers who work with the homeless population, providers that work with reentry, people coming out of prison. Um, look at your SNAP and TANF uh, customers and the, the organization that provides services for them. And I've got the list here goes on, and these are just some, some um, organizations that I could think of right off the bat that I know will help us with those customers who fall into the priority of services. So for a lot of workforce boards, I think this is going to be about making those connections happen, being a convener, and then really important, listen to what those people tell you. What are they saying they need in order to do their job? What does a referral really look like? In other words, instead of just writing on a piece of paper the address of a workforce center, what is it going to take for us to actually partner with those providers in making these services happen? And I'm here to tell you it works. We've done it now. When you look at these, um, the list I've got up here, we've done this with customers in just about every targeted area. So for us, our big challenge and, and one we're really excited about is now bringing all these organizations together and providing really quality services for those um, low wage earners in our community. And, and uh, Amy, I think that's it for me.
Well, thanks so much, Debbie. Um, we are going to have some time for questions. Um, actually, I want to ask um, Amy and Debbie just a couple questions quickly um, before we open it up. Um, first, do you find it harder to reach performance targets when you serve these populations? And if so, how do you overcome those challenges? Um, Anna, this is Amy. And for us, um, I'll be due to our literacy level being a lot lower and our poverty, our, the participants are in our programs longer. We do reach our performance measures. Our performance measures in the last three years for entered employments range from 72% all the way to 82% um, for the last program years, for the last years. So we do get them. It just takes us a little more time. They need a little more hand-holding, may need some prerequisite classes. Um, and true follow-up is definitely um, needed because some of our popular, harder to serve populations coming in and out of jobs. And so that's something that we um, do. We follow them for over, t for over 12 months to make sure that they are happy and they don't need other training and they like their jobs. So it is harder to achieve those, but um, it's doable. And Debbie? And, uh, you know, it's interesting, um, our performance arm of the board um, has over the years run the stats for us to let us know what's behind the numbers. And one of the interesting thing, uh, things I've seen is that 20% of the people who walk in the door of our centers and actually go into our programs have criminal backgrounds. So it's not as if these individuals aren't already coming in to the centers. Um, we also have the employment arm of the TANF and SNAP programs, so we have the opportunity to reach out to those customers from the very beginning of their eligibility on SNAP or um, on um, TANF. And because of the work requirements around it, we are also able to do um, subsidized employment or transitional employment in the area that they are most interested in. So these customers are coming into our centers already. Um, and if you're capturing this information, you probably will see that it's not going to be that big of a change. I mean, it would be a change if we were looking at 2010, when the unemployment rate reached all-time highs across the nation and including in Tarrant County. Um, then, yes, it, it would have been harder for those individuals with multiple barriers to get service. But as I said, with an unemployment rate standing at 4%, I think if you look at the customers you're serving in your centers, you're going to see they're already there. And if you're making performance now and those individuals are in your centers, then it really isn't that outside the box to think that you're going to be able to exceed performance in the coming years. Great. So um, second, I just want to ask, what advice would you all give to other areas who want to serve these populations better? Debbie, you've said a little bit about that. Yes. I think that it's absolutely essential that we use this opportunity when organizations are asking about this new legislation. Uh, it's been real a, a lot of fun for me to, to be out in the community and actually have people ask me about WIOA and what it means and what impact it's going to have on them. I got a call just this morning from an executive director of a local nonprofit asking me that very question. So we intend to have a workforce summit and invite in the fall and invite our, um, our local providers in the community, whether they are federal or state or local agencies or local nonprofits um, or faith-based organizations or individuals who are interested in learning more. And during this um, summit, we're going to talk about WIOA, but we're also going to have our own listening session where we listen to what these nonprofits or other agencies really think their customers need. So I would use this rollout of WIOA as a starting point for discussions that can lead to better services for our customers. That's great. Thanks so much, Debbie. Amy, did you have anything you wanted to add about advice you'd give other areas who want to serve these populations better? For the TANF and the um, public assistance, it definitely have a closer relationship with your uh, state HHS provider. That has been key for us to make sure that when that with um, TANF regulations around participation, some of the things that we do did under WIA and will continue in WIOA 
um, don't necessarily line up with their performance measures. So having that discussion locally as well as statewide about how, how those systems can come in line a little bit better, help out um, for sure. We are lucky in Washington State that we ha uh, have a statewide um, transitional jobs program that is for TANF recipients. So we have, and that was in, um, one of the first in 1997. So we've been having that close relationship um, since that time. So it definitely pays off for your participants. Great. So thanks. And we've got a question here for Debbie, and I think it will apply to Amy too. How do you all handle referrals? Well, you know, to me, that's one of the areas that we definitely need to improve on. Um, currently, it, it works for us because we have MOUs or contracts with probably over 15 or 20 nonprofits in the area, so those referrals come and go between the organizations. But it, it's our executive director and management team's goal to now include people that we perhaps haven't partnered with. Um, and if you look at WIOA and the regulations around this, they're pretty clear how they want this to be. They want this to be an active referral, not a passive referral. And that requires relationship building. And so one of the things, if you want to make sure that you get to those individuals, um, perhaps who are homeless and basic skills deficient, that you've got to know who your providers are for homeless services in your community, and you're going to have to develop a better way of doing active referrals into the organization and having those referrals and communications go both ways. For um, us in Washington, the majority of the referrals come through our one-stop centers, and if not, we do have um, in some of our more rural areas where we have an affiliate site or don't have a one-stop, they come into the community center or where those staff are located in those communities, so they come directly in. We do have other agencies that do make referrals, but it's majority people um, find their way to us through the one-stop centers. Okay, great. And we've got a lot of questions here about partnering. Um, let's see, I'll just throw out a couple. Any experience in partnering with literacy councils? Or in Texas, how do you partner with adult ed? Well, in Texas, um, it's, it's been a very interesting um, last 18 months or so, because now we are a, a, a active partner um, in our literacy coalition and the providers of literacy services. We've had for years, we've had um, GED sites or learning labs in our centers, but over the past 18 months, we've really expanded um, our participation in that, as has other boards across the state of Texas. Um, this, is, this came um, from the Texas Workforce Commission down to the local boards, and we've had a very interesting 18 months learning more about um, literacy and literacy providers. In Washington, our um, literacy partners are in our works, our one-stop centers, and or they will have, even on our rural centers, they have um, telecommunication classes um, as well as their own. They will, may have other um, literacy centers throughout our county and different communities. Um, we are our local community college and uh, sit on our boards and some of our one-stop boards and committees. So they are very active and involved um, um, because literacy in our area, we have low, very low literacy rates in all of our counties. Hmm. Great. Okay, well here's another similar question. Do you have any examples of providers working with supportive housing or affordable housing projects serving formerly homeless people? Um, this is Debbie. We actually have a contract um, with our local uh, mental health provider who has a grant to find individuals in the, in the homeless community with mental illness and assist them in finding permanent housing. And a piece of that is employment. Um, I'm also on the board of the Tarrant County Homeless Coalition, so we have a, and have had for um, since the inception of the board a very close working relationship with the Homeless Coalition and the providers who now are under the a continuum of care um, with the Homeless Coalition. So it's absolutely essential to have those relationships in housing. In Washington and Yakima and all of our counties, we have um, we. Uh, connections with our homeless networks, 
We as well have a Workforce Innovation Fund grant in Washington um, that uh, works with homeless individuals and getting them through Workforce Innovation Fund projects, and it's a research project. So yes, we are, have um, most of our as you, there's a lot of our individuals in our all of our programs, whether youth, adult, or dislocated workers, that are homeless. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Here's a question for Debbie: um, How can I find out more about the Next Step program, and what kind of placement rates and retention rates were achieved, and how would WIOA help fund or otherwise affect Next Step? Well, I think one of the th let me address the last part of that question first. I think we learned so much about the model that we're using, the assessments that we're using, the, the workshops or the boot camp that we did, customized job development. We used um, a project like Next Step to be an incubator of ideas. Um, we now have um, two other national grants that we're working with using the same model, uh, and our, our um, contractor that runs our workforce centers is in constant dialogue with us about what we've done in Next Step. And we'll continue to, to uh, um, operate this program. And I think my name and email address is, is on the slides. And I would love to talk to anyone who wants to learn more about it. I think, I think we've learned some lessons that, that we would love to share with anyone who's interested. Great. So there's Debbie's contact information if you want to get um, back in touch with Debbie. So here's a question I think it's a little hard. Um, someone has written us, it's easy to say form partnerships, but what factors or agreements have you found helpful to forming successful and results-driven partnerships? You know, I, I can take that first. Um, I would say Understanding that other organization's performance measures is key. Um, it's, it, it's nice to say you want to partner with someone, but you need to also understand what they're looking for. Um, whether it's with a foundation, whether it's foundation funding or United Way funding or other governmental entities that are funding these programs, it tends to be that they have performance measures they have to meet. So understanding that and figuring how you can help them make performance is a great starting point. But I do believe there has to be a, a dialogue first. I don't think you can just walk up to an organization and say, you know, hey, we want to partner with you. I think you've got to listen first, um, which is why we're doing this summit around WIOA. We need to know what the nonprofits need from us. Instead of just telling them what we do, we need to listen to what they do and figure out where their performance marries our performance and how we can best serve um, their population uh, in our centers. And I would agree with Debbie. That, I would agree with Debbie. That's the, the performance is the key in the door. And then after that, it's those relationships that you establish with them and working with our participants that help it go forward and continue. Great. Um, well, here's a question for Debbie. Central Texas has a lot of veterans with Fort Hood right here. Um, would our focus need to put vets training second? And I guess that's partially a question for me as well. Um, I think that what we are proposing would, um, um, I'm not sure. I don't think it would put them in front of vets. I think it would say that it would have to be, oh, it, it, actually under WIOA, it says that these groups um, need to be a top priority. So I think it's possible that this um, idea would put uh, those populations uh, above, equal, equal to, equal to that's training. Yeah. I, Debbie, I, did you I, want to say more about veterans? Yeah, I mean, I've found that especially those veterans who are coming back from Afghanistan or Iraq have issues that need to be addressed and have many times multiple barriers and can be basic skills deficient just as any other customer. So I, I would anticipate that we will serve more vets um, using this model, not less. Great. Thank you. Um, and a question for Amy. 
Amy, how did Washington, how did the Washington Web get the reading level data on all adults? We got it through the census. Um, we, through our, when we developed our strategic plan, we um, delve into all the census information and pulled all that out. And that's how they categorize it, under six and under two. Great. Under sixth grade and under second grade. All right. Um, OK, so we've got one more question about um, do the proposed regs define basic skills deficient? And I just want to share the basic skills deficient um, definition from WIOA. And it says the basic skills deficient means, with respect to an individual, two things. Either A, a youth that the individual has English, reading, writing, or computing skills at or below the eighth grade level on a generally accepted standardized test. Or second, who is a youth or adult that the individual is unable to compute or solve problems or read, write, or speak English at a level necessary to function on the job in the individual's family or in society. And as some of you may know, the second part of that definition is new to Title I. Um, that's an, an a expanding of the definition of basic skills deficient. And with the addition of basic skills deficient to the priority of service, we're waiting to see what will happen um, when you have this expanded definition of basic skill deficient. Um, who, who are the folks that are going to get in under this broader um, view of basic skills deficient? Um, so let's see. Um, so Amy, not sure if you have this in front of you, but what percent of the TANF caseload would be in your local area or enrolled in the adult services program? I let me. I would have to look that up, but we. Um, I have just our Yakima, which is our most biggest area. Yakima out of Yakima County serves about 2,500 TANF. TANF adults um, a month. So of that, we don't serve a large portion through um, WIA, but we do through our other transitional jobs pro project. We serve a lot more because it's only for TANF. So um, I could I have that readily available for all four of our counties. I just don't know it off the top of my head because it changes every year. Sure. And uh, can you say how the tra having the transitional jobs? Um, program has helped you to better serve TANF recipients? The, the, um, our adult provider is also a provider of the transitional jobs, the TANF program, which is called Community Jobs in our state. And um, they put them through a six-month um, work experience or internship at a nonprofit or government agency. And they work for, um, and they get a paid wage, it's a paid, and these individuals sometimes have uh, up to eight barriers to employment. Throughout that process, some of them that express an interest to go into like a, a, a certified training or some other or um, an OJT or on the job training, we will then co-enroll with them and provide that through our WIA services. It's been a good partnership to work with those um, people when they're ready the TANF folks when they're ready for something more other than when their barriers are managed, when they're ready to um, get employment. And so it's been a great partnership. Uh, like I said, the TJ program was in 1997, and it's still it's one of the first um, around the country and is still to this day um, active and very um, going strong. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so I think what we're going to do is uh, go to the phone and allow folks to ask questions over the phone. Um, I think the way this works is you, um, you raise your hand, and then we will unmute you. And you can ask your questions of me or Debbie or Amy. So we'll take a moment to see if folks have questions. Also, if you want to, you can take this time to um, tell us in the chat box a little more about what you think about our recommendation to um, 
to set the priority for high need individuals um, in the same way as the veterans uh, priority is uh, specified in detail in statute and in regulations and in guidance. Um, so you'll have a few more minutes to, to type in some of your ideas. And thank you to those of you who have already sent in your thoughts on that issue. We're going to pull this slide back up so people can see. So here we go. This is the question for participants. What do you think of class potential recommendation to implement the priority for high need adults in the same way as the priority for veterans? And as I mentioned, DOL already knows how to do this. Um, upon passage of the Veterans uh, Job for Veterans Act of 2002, DOL provided a final rule um, that had immediate clarification and extensive implementation support for implementing the veterans' priority of service, including requiring states to address the priority of service in comprehensive state plans requiring states to develop policies governing state, local, regional, local, and one-stops. Um, they have specific policies to identify eligible individuals at the point of entry. Um, the rules, regulations, and guidance also identify how eligible individuals would be informed of the priority. Um, it's also required that local plans articulate policies and protocols in their local plans, um, requiring policies to be made publicly available and accessible, also defining in detail what it means to provide a priority of service, requiring federal monitoring of this provision in the final rule, and reporting on priority of service as part of an annual report. So as you can see, the, and as many of you probably know, the implementation of the veterans' priority um, has, has a lot of detail and robustness. Um, and we are proposing that um, the uh, priority for high need individuals be set with the same level of specificity. I feel like we should have a little music here. <laughs> well, we'll look if we have things coming in. Huh. Uh, we're hearing that people think it's an excellent idea, and people think it's important. Um, I have here that they do not believe veterans should re receive priority over others. Um, yes, we have a variety of comments. Um, one says, this is a smart idea. Prioritizing is done for vets using existed methods and smart to link to vets' issues. Um, here, though, we have on first blush, I think it would not be equal comparison to use veteran standard for the ELL population. Let's see. Here is a slightly different opinion. Um, while our veterans deserve and have earned number one priority, this population we're talking about today should be directly behind that priority and above all other targeted populations. OK, we've got three hands raised. So we're going to take some questions. And the first one is from Daryl. Daryl, are you there? Daryl, are you with us? Okay. 
Well, let's move on to one of those other three hands. OK, we're looking for Lori. Lori, are you here with a question for us? Lori, could you speak into your phone? Make sure and make sure mute isn't on. Well, we may be having some technical difficulties here, folks. We're going to try one more. I'm going to try Jeannie. Jeannie, are you there? Do you have a question for us about priority of service? Well, I guess we're having technical difficulties, folks. Oh, Lori, Lori just said she was talking and we couldn't hear her. Well, we're so sorry, Lori, um, and to everyone for, for this delay here. Um, Lori, do you want to try again? OK. Well, oh, Lori, we're so sorry. We see you writing that you're trying to get through and for some reason cannot. And we really apologize for that. Um, so I think we should take this opportunity to wrap up. Uh, I just want to thank my co-presenters, Amy Martinez from South Central Workforce Council in Yakima County, Washington, and Debbie Cracky from the Workforce Solutions for Tarrant County in Fort Worth, Texas. Thanks very much to our presenters. And thank you very much to each of you um, who participated in our webinar today. Um, you should look in your inbox tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow, for a um, recording of this webinar and also uh, an advanced copy of the paper that we're sending out on priority of service. So thanks very much, everyone.